Hi, this is Pete Chasar. I'm here again at the Maley Arts Center, Pelican Bay Arts Association, here to interview our Artist of the Month, Leslie Wilkerson. And once again, behind the, behind the camera is Garrett Smith, and also by his side, Rachel Gates, who is our gallery coordinator. And here we go. Okay. Leslie, one of the things that was missing in your bio, and I'm always interested in asking artists is, where did you grow up? Where did you go to high school? And you know, the other stuff, you're starting at your bio at age 55, and you had a life before that. So I'd like to know a little bit about, you know, again, where did you grow up? Where did you go to high school, for, for starters? Okay, well, I uh, grew up in uh, Northern California, uh, and I went to high school uh, in my hometown, Reading, as well as Orland. Okay. And um, yes, I know things start at 55 because prior to that, I had another life which had nothing to do with art. I was a auto repossessor, a bounty hunter, and a bill collector, mm -hmm. and paralegal. So interesting combination. And you know, a lot of the people that we talk to, most of the artists here, they are doing art from kindergarten and even before that. So didn't you have any uh, inclination to do art at an early age like that? Oh yes, I did. And, and when I went away, I graduated high school and then I went away to college and I came back home uh, my first week with 18 units, signed up for 18 units and 15 of them were in the art room and my father flat told me he wasn't going to pay for my education. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So being a, a young woman at 17 yeah. and unsure about what I should be doing, I went back into the family business and that's where... What was the family business? The repossession okay. collection agency okay. kind okay. of thing. I repossessed my first car at the age of 16. Sure. So what was it then at 55 that turned, turned, uh, turned you on and then made you do the graphic design studies? Well, I had a... Uh, and a real, uh, I had an accident, and it was really life changing for me. Um, I blew out my back, and I spent several years trying to deal with that. Uh, and my father passed away at the same time. <clears throat> and the family dynamics, well, I always like to say that we put the D in dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll just be honest with you, it's kind of how it is. Um, so I wanted to get back to art, and I wanted another life. So I just left. I just left the business. I left the money on the table. I left the interest in the business. And I left and I went back to school at 55. Now, you studied graphic design. Mm -hmm. Your show now is, and what you do now is uh, photography, but a different kind of photography, art, or photo art. How did you gravitate to photo art? Um, Two, two reasons. Um, I'm not an illustrator. I'm not somebody that draws. I was going to say, you don't know how to draw. Is that <laughs> well, it? No, I can draw. It's just not my thing. And um, what is my thing is I'm extremely visual. And I am, because I ha I've had that street smarts of you've got to get your act together in 10 seconds or less and kind of scope out what's going around you, I have the ability to catch images uh, in a frame. I like what's going on with inside the frame of the camera. And I like instant. Instant's good for me. <laughs> so that's why I got involved with the photography. And I had a wonderful mentor at Chico State, and that was Byron Wolf, okay. uh, who is now uh, teaching at Temple uh, University. Yeah. And in your bio, uh, you mention a lot of other inspirations that you had over the years. Could you Name those names too? Um, yes, uh, so I got very attracted to the Bajas um, mm -hmm. and things that were going on at the Bajas uh, prior to World War II. And Laszlo uh, Moholy Nagy was, I, oh, what he was doing with photography was mm -hmm. just inspirational for me. And uh, Beatrice Abbott, now she's the gal who photographed the backside of the Statue of Liberty. Interesting. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, there is a backside. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, Erwin Elliott, who was a master street photographer and always could catch the absurd, one of the images that really pops to mind is the old man walking through the museum and he's all hunched back over with a cane 
and here are these two old dinosaurs that he's walking by. Mm -hmm. So these these little subtle things. So sure, those sure. are very inspirational to me. Now another thing that you mentioned is that you got very dissatisfied pretty quickly with images on paper. Yes. What, what is that about? What, what, why not paper? Well, um, okay, so let's... let's You're going to show us some props? Yes, I have show and tell. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I have show props and tell. Props are good. So what happens with paper is paper, to me, sucks the quality of the color and the quality of the light because paper is going to absorb some of that ink. Um, and I really didn't like that. The other thing I wasn't happy with is the limitation. It was paper. Mm -hmm. That was all you could do with it. Um, and I got involved in discovering, uh, shortly after I went back to school, I think my second year, uh, Digital Alchemy. And this is uh, a book done by uh, Bonnie um, Hoka. And I've actually gone to Colorado where she's at and studied with her. Um, she's got works in the Smithsonian. She's uh, the who's who of women in uh, art um, here in the United States. So she was really inspirational. Now that term almost sounds like a contradiction, digital alchemy. Right. In simple terms, what does it mean? Well, you're taking that digital image, because obviously I'm working digital. Okay. Okay, so you take that digital image, and then you're going to take that image and produce it on some type of different substrate. Okay. And explain what a substrate is. Well, to me, a substrate is anything that isn't normal. <laughs> so... Because, you know, in like in architecture, substrate is the the background, the structure that holds yes. something together. Yeah. So, so let's so let's take a look at some substrates here. So let me get um, this. So this is glass. So here is an image um, that has been done on glass. And it's one of your images. Right, it's one of okay. my images, and I'll show you here how I how I've done that. So there's another one here that is done on plexiglass. So I've taken the image and I've done it on plexiglass. Okay. Then what I really got fascinated with was metal. <laughs> why, why so? Because there was this huge salvage yard in Chico. <laughs> Are you talking about it's more economical? Well, it was economical and I just found great pieces of aluminum that had been discarded and I kind of resonated to that. I really felt pretty discarded after I'd uh, gotten injured. I had a, a bout with dealing with opiate painkillers like most people have did at that time uh, with a fentanyl patch. And so I really felt some, some, some kindred ship there in the, in the salvage yard. So this is done on metal. So metal is where I went to begin with, with it. Um, and I was producing on huge uh, panels, uh, sometimes like 36 by 48, 32 mm -hmm. by 36, and they got heavy and really heavy. Sure, sure. <laughs> and heavier. Right. And then I started producing on um, panels. And this panel is done with Venetian plaster. Okay. Okay, so how th does this all happen? It happens because you start with... A piece of film? Yep, a piece of transparency film. So you remember when the overhead projectors in school? Mm -hmm, sure. So this is transparency film. Right. Uh, it's a special transparency film that has the right teeth, tooth to it to take what I'm going to produce using a solution. So you can see the images here. Okay. Now are you limited by the size that the transparency comes in? by how big you can make the, the final piece, or can you photo expand somehow? Well, my limitations occur because of a printer. Okay. I can do something that's 44 inches wide if I have the printer for that. And that's the limitation in my world right now, is printer. Okay. Um, that's an $8,000 printer that better be used every day to make it happen. Yeah. What kind of uh, material goes through that printer? Can anything 
Can it print on anything, literally? Um, you can print on the transparency film, and you can see that. This is a larger uh, piece. This is a 13 by 19, and I actually have a printer that does that. Mm -hmm. So you can see here the transparency. Um, you can uh, print it on all sorts of photo paper or whatever, you, and you actually are printing directly on the transparency film. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's directly on the, so instead of the paper, it's the transparency film. Sure, sure. Now, so far, everything we've talked about is kind of technical. What about the images themselves? What is your inspiration, or what is your, how does your idea process work to create a piece? Well, <laughs> so it's kind of hard to explain. Um, I really want to express myself in my pieces, so I have a tendency to gravitate to different things. So let's talk about some gravitation. Um, one of the things that I gravitate to is Ferris wheels. Interesting. And this, I don't know if you can tell, Pete, but there's some darkness here. That is actually a food wrapper that I scanned in from the fair. So it becomes one of the layers in the images. Okay. This is the inside of a transmission. Yep. And I have a photo scanner that allows me to scan a deep object. And so I combined the transparency or the um, transmission with an image of a building that has a sign painted on it in San Francisco. The other thing that I gravitate to are um, Freeman uh, did reflection images, so I can gravitate towards that. And then the, some of the other things I'll gravitate to are dolls. I really kind of like Interesting. dolls. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm not positive why. Well, what I'm missing is do your ideas for the piece come from the individual images or do you have an overall idea first and then fit the images to that idea? No, it's the image. The image is the driver. Okay. The image yeah, is so the they're driver. the inspiration. Right. So this piece that that's behind me here, which is down there at the uh, uh, beach there in Santa Monica, which is a lifeguard station, um, that that image drove the rest of the art paper that's around it. Okay. And what do the the other parts of that whole piece represent in relation to the lifeguard station? Um, so to me, the tan part of that would be the sunset, uh, and you can see that playing out in the image itself. Um, the uh, cardboard that I've used there is kind of uh, the same as the railing. The blue is obviously the ocean. The kind of um, uh, taupe that you see there is the sand, and then the white, um, design that I did over the top of it is just kind of how the ocean is to me. Okay. And, and I'm glad we're talking about the images here now because we're here to talk about this show. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me is the, the pieces that you picked to put on this wall. And I would imagine these are kind of your favorite pieces. Is that the case? Because there, there's more to the show, obviously. Oh, um, no, I like all, I like those pieces. They're, okay. they're my favorite, but I'm drawn towards probably the darker stuff. Okay. <laughs> Personally. Okay. And, uh, you know, what's the reasoning there, or what's the inspiration there? What is that? Well, um, one of the images um, that I have here in the show is the bird uh, in a film image, and that bird and flight, I really like the freedom mm -hmm. of that. So to me, there's an emotional attachment to that, which is the freedom. Uh, another image is reflections, uh, where an individual is standing in uh, the water puddle. I really like how that plays kind of on life, because you sit back and reflect about what's going on. Uh, another one that I like is the human experience. Um, I got very fascinated with a mannequin at a, at a junk store. <laughs> I understand now it was a CPR 
doll, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, and uh, I really got fascinated with that, and then I did an overlay of a tree with it, so it's kind of like the human experience. Um, and another one uh, that I really gravitate towards is the teddy bear and the Ferris wheel, and that's Teddy Dreams. Um, that's another one yeah. that I like. And so what is it about the fer I meant to ask this earlier. What is it about the Ferris wheels? Is it that they're circular? Is it that they go around? What is what's so, the fascination? So it's like childhood like, experience? Uh, yes, probably, but I don't remember that. Okay. Uh, what I like about it is a Ferris wheel is like life. Sometimes you're going around in the Ferris wheel and you're really happy about the Ferris wheel. It's a great ride. Mm -hmm. You're excited. You know, you're getting to see things. And, and then sometimes you can't wait for it to be over. You'd just rather get off of the Ferris wheel. You know, maybe you had too much cotton candy. And I think that's also how life is. Life is kind of like a Ferris wheel. There's this circular okay. thing that goes on, and at the top it's really breathtaking, and at the bottom it can be a letdown, or sometimes you can't wait to get off the heights because the bottom is, is safer. So okay. that's probably yeah. why I like the Ferris wheels. Now, this show is called Layers. Mm -hmm. But you have other series, Streetscapes, if I'm not mistaken, and mm -hmm. some others. Why is this one called Layers, in, as opposed to those others? Since this is the show that's here, it'd be good to understand what that means. So, so we kind of touched on it uh, a little bit a uh, while back when we talked about the format. You know that I could do something that's 44 inches, and I said, well, I don't have access to that printer. Right. I lost access to that printer um, here uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, not COVID related, the business just shut down uh, that I was shipping stuff out to. So I had to figure out another way to okay. work. And the other thing that occurred, uh, that I, I met Donna Watson, who uh, is a wabasabi artist. Oh, that's an interesting one too. I was gonna ask you about that. But continue, and I'll get back to the wabasabi. So I got in, it got involved uh, taking a workshop with her before COVID about how wabasabi worked and about papers, and I got very attracted because I could see that paper could enhance the image. I could still work large mm -hmm. and still you and be able to use the printer that I have in my studio as opposed to trying to find another place to print. So, so now do you take paper images and paste them onto the substrate? Is that what you do or how do you get Well, there's two things to do. One of them is an emulsion lift where I'm taking the image, I'm sealing it with my secret super sauce that Bonnie mm -hmm. uh, did, and I make an emulsion lift just like you do with the Polaroid uh, way back when when we were kids. So the transparency film gets coated and then you set this in water dip it in water, and overnight, the image lifts off. Oh, okay. And then it becomes a skin. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And you can wrinkle up the skin. You can paint the back of the skin if you want the image to come through. Or another thing that's really fascinating with for me is remake paper, which is used in a museum for uh, stabilizing um, artwork that needs to be uh, refurbished. So this is printed on and you can see how that works sure. with the reaming paper. So that's what I'm using and oh and here's the uh, it's a big one of the human experience. Interesting. And this is actually on what's known as surf paper, which is a Japanese paper. A little bit uh, more opaque. Uh, the first emulsion that I ever did is here. And you can see that you can scrunchy up the edges. May I? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. So how do you get it onto the substrate? Matte medium. Oh, okay. That's it. She just, matte sure. medium is the best glue. <laughs> so this is all done with matte medium. And I think that I probably haven't mentioned this, but the way you get it off the transparency and then maybe on to the metal is using this super sauce solution that Bonnie okay. developed. Very and it's an alcohol base, so I have the windows open, and I use 91% alcohol. As you can see, it's pretty versatile. I mean, you can transfer onto anything. It looks like uh, we're running out of time. Are we running out of time? Can we have time to talk about yeah. wabasabi? What is wabasabi? 
So as simple as you can make it. So wabasabi is a 14th century Japanese movement or term about embracing the embracing the imperfection. Gosh knows that I'm not perfect, yeah. and neither is anything else in this world. So it resonates with me. We're not perfect. <laughs> We're not. So it resonates with me, and that's the beauty of these papers because there's all of this imperfection when you work with these papers. Some of these papers adhere well. Some of them require extra work. Some of them are very delicate. They all have imperfections because they're all handmade. Well, except obviously the cardboard. Uh, but they're all handmade papers uh, and stamps. So you get all of this imperfection that comes out. And that's what the emulsion lifts do as well. And that's part of the process and that's part of the creativity. Yes. Very good. Yes. I, th I think we've got it. It's um, layers. Leslie Wilkerson show, photo art, Manly Art Center, 11 to 3, Thursday through Saturday. Please come by and see the show.